Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for coming. We will be talking about, um, we're continuing to talk about uh, gynecological conditions. Um, as always, feel free to pop any questions in the chat that you want to ask. Um, and then we can move to... Mm -hmm. Some disclaimers for today, as always, this is not medical advice, and if you're concerned about any of these issues that we're talking about today, please talk to your doctor. Um, and these patients' experiences do not represent everyone with their condition. As we all know, um, there's a spectrum to every condition that we talk about, and not everything applies to everyone. And we are primarily focusing, focusing on endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS and adenomyosis. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of review to go over some things from last meeting for those of you um, who did not make it and just a refresher for those who did. Um, endometriosis is when tissue similar to the uterine lining grows outside of the uterus. So it usually grows in and on and on the outside of surface of the uterus, ovaries, fallopian tubes, um, tissue lining the pelvis and ligaments around the uterus, sometimes even um, on upper organs, but that's very rare. Um, PCOS is when the ovaries produce uh, more androgen, the quote unquote male sex home hormone than usual. And this can lead to um, typically male characteristics such as more body hair, thinning of hair on the head, along with many other symptoms. And adenomyosis is when the lining of the uterus, which is also called the endometrium, um, grows into the muscle wall of the uterus. Um, and symptoms for these gynecological conditions are often similar and are, the causes are often difficult to pinpoint. So they can be confused for one another sometimes. So um, many people with uteruses suffer from a variety of these conditions and there's not a lot of research out there. So if you're interested in these topics, please consider this specialty area or doing research into it. Um, and endometriosis and adenomyosis are different conditions but are very similar in nature, as I mentioned, and PCOS, endometriosis, and adenomyosis. Um, have very similar symptoms, so imaging is often required to identify the issues. And then we will start to introduce our special guests. We have Laura, we have Kiana, and Kayla. If you guys would like to um, briefly say something about yourselves, go ahead. I guess I'll go first since I'm the first one on there. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, I run the Instagram Indo Babe Club. Um, I have the Holy Trinity, all three of them. Um, yeah, so I don't know what else to say besides that. Um, and I guess you'll hear more in a second. Um, I can go next. So my name is Kiana. I also run an Instagram called Endometriosis. Um, I have endometriosis and suspected uh, adenomyosis. Um, and I also work on the board of directors for the Canadian Endo uh, Organization. Hi everyone, I'm Kayla. Um, I run the account Endo Adeno Warrior. I have endometriosis and adenomyosis, uh, but I've had three surgeries for my endo, so I'm mostly dealing with adenomyosis pain. Um, and I'm a registered nurse, but I'm not working because of my illnesses. So yeah, I don't know. That's about, that's a little blurb about me. Okay. Um, so we'll start in with the questions here. Uh, what is I mean, you guys kind of already said this, what is your experience with endometriosis, PCOS slash denomyosis, and what is your worst symptom? Or what was, if you have now have somewhat relief at least? Um, my experience has been kind of interesting because I feel like I haven't had all three at the same time. I had my first surgery for my endometriosis in March, 2020, like the week the world shut down, like right beforehand. Um, and since then I've been endo free. Um, and then about five months later, I started getting pain coming back. Um, but it was slightly different, um, in different areas and felt different. And I had endo, oh my gosh, adenomyosis then, and I had a hysterectomy last June to, um, to cure it. And my PCOS, it's never really been, I feel like it's never really been a huge issue for me. It's like I got diagnosed, went on medicine and haven't had too many 
problems. Um, I have some symptoms, but since I don't have periods anymore, it's kind of just like managing my insulin resistance in the her that comes with PCOS. My worst symptom has been pain, tons and tons of pain. Pain and food intolerances have been the worst for me. Um, I can go next. Um, so yeah, I've been dealing with endometriosis since I got my first period, which was early um, in comparison to my friends. Um, so I've been, since I was about like 11 or 12, um, I was hospitalized when I was 15 uh, because I wasn't able to eat because of the pain. So I'd lost a significant amount of weight. Um, and I was very lucky because that was when I first heard the word endometriosis. I was in a very small town in rural Canada um, and the doctor that was treating me in the ER um, just happened to know what it was, uh, which is a very rare occurrence. Um, and yeah, they mentioned it to me. So then when I was out of the hospital, I was able to go to my uh, general practitioner and mention it to them. Um, unfortunately, being in northern BC at the time, uh, it was really hard to get treatment. And obviously, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what endo was. I figured that my doctors knew best um, with the disease, which is a very um, unfortunate thing that they don't. Um, that's why it's so important for specialists uh, to be involved in care and treatment. Um, so I ended up having a surgery, an exploratory uh, laparoscopy in Northern BC uh, with a doctor who definitely shouldn't have been performing it. Um, and it came back with no endometriosis. But when you look at the surgery uh, imaging, uh, it's very clear even to me who I'm not a doctor that I do have endometriosis all over. And from those images, I was able to be diagnosed by a different specialist. Um, and now I'm just in the midst of waiting for uh, another uh, surgery in Toronto um, to get excision done. And my worst symptom is pain, um, debilitating pain. Um, and like they were saying, it's different for everybody. Everybody has different symptoms. Uh, some people don't experience pain at all, um, but pain to the point of not being able to do any kind of daily tasks, like go to school. Um, I had to quit figure skating. I sometimes even walking to the bathroom is so painful that I can barely do it. Um, so yeah, definitely pain is my worst symptom. All right. Um... My worst symptom is also pain, debilitating pain, and nausea. I get severe nausea. Um, and what was like the original question? I'm like what blanking out. Is you, what has been your experience with it? Oh, okay. So um, I started experiencing symptoms when I first got my cycle at 13, but I didn't seek help till I was 15. Um, they put me on birth control, just told me it was normal to have painful periods. And my mom thought it was normal because she grew up with painful periods. So I just kind of lived with it and um, on and off would go to the ER for severe pain. And they would tell me things like, oh, mm -hmm. it's gas, like, and they wouldn't believe me and just blow me off. Um and it wasn't until I was working as a nurse that my symptoms got so severe that I was nearly passing out at work. And my coworkers were like, you need to take a leave of absence and figure out what's going on with you. And I saw, um, I was in the process of seeing like different gynecologists. And then the third or fourth gynecologist I saw was like, you sound like you have endometriosis, adenomyosis, and um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So right when she said that as a nurse, I went to do my research and luckily I found out the difference between ablation and excision right away. Um, and I did have surgery with an excision specialist. However, he left endometriosis on my bowel because my surgery was so extensive that they didn't think that I could handle more removal of the, of the endo. Um, and then a year later, I was still in a ton of pain and had another surgery with him where they removed the endo off my bowel and a couple other spots. Um, 
And then unfortunately I was still in pain. And I just had my third surgery in November with a new surgeon. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Center for Endometriosis Care in Atlanta. So I went there and I had surgery with Dr. Sinervo. Um, and I feel like my endo pain is better, but my uterine pain is still really bad. So I'm basically um, trying to manage with medications to to hold off on a hysterectomy. Um, so what made you slash your doctor first suspect that you have it and what was it like getting diagnosed? I mean, I don't really think any of my regular gynos when I was like first working on getting diagnosed, which I mean, I remember my mom taking me to the gyno when I was like 15, 16 for the first time. And they dismissed me pretty much all of my doctors always dismissed me until, um, I think I was about 22 and I'm 27, almost 28 now. And I was looking up like, why the heck would I have debilitating periods? And the first thing that popped up was endometriosis and all the symptoms fit. I had almost every single one of them. So I just told my doctors, like, I have it, I think I have it. And I got dismissed, told to get pregnant, which is not, <laughs> that's not it. <laughs> Don't listen to the doctors um, that tell you that. Um, and birth control and why would I help you when you're not trying to get pregnant? Um, so when I first went to my first excision specialist, um, he was like, yeah, I don't know if you have it. And then I told, well, I'm in pain, like, eight out of 10 pain every day. I'm having trouble walking sometimes. I can't do my daily tasks. Um, and he's like, well, I guess we could do surgery and just see. And then I ended up having stage one endometriosis, which just means not a lot of endometriosis, but that doesn't have anything done. It doesn't have any correlation with, um, symptoms. So it took like a good 10 years, 10, 11 years, um, for me to get diagnosed so it's a long process and it's really hard um and it's really stressful and lonely at times um you know people around you they try to understand um you know you know my husband my now husband really tried to understand but you know until I found Instagram last year you just feel so alone in it um so it's really lonely but it's worth it because then you get help in the end <laughs> um yeah I definitely can relate to being blown off <laughs> by all the doctors and um being told that it's not necessarily in your head I feel like a lot of people get told that but um it was more or less that you just have a lower pain threshold um what you're experiencing isn't as bad. You just can't handle it. And I knew deep down that wasn't true. Um, I definitely have a very high pain tolerance. Um, and so same kind of thing for me. Um, it was really great. Um, I'm one of the rare people that right off the bat, I got told that it could be endometriosis, but unfortunately, because I went to that surgeon in Northern BC, they told me I did not have it. Um, released me and then I started going down different avenues um, with bowel conditions all of this again showed up nothing um, so it was just really frustrating it was hard I was 17 when I had my first surgery um, and yeah again I'm 25 now so I haven't legally been diagnosed with endo like I said um, you have to have the surgery to be diagnosed and have a biopsy um, but via imaging um, my specialist now was able to give the 99.9% .9 uh, endometriosis um, diagnosis. Uh, just from looking at the imaging, it's very clear. Um, there's adhesions everywhere and lesions um, that the doctor didn't know how to, like they just thought it was normal. Um, what was it like? So yeah, I haven't been officially diagnosed. I consider myself to have endometriosis uh, because of all of this, but once I have that surgery, I know it will just be um, like a sigh of relief. Um, 
but at the same time, there's no cure for it. So it's kind of one of those things that you have to trust so much in the doctor that you're going to, um, making sure that they're completely qualified. And we're not just talking qualified, we're talking one of the better surgeons um, so that they can get it um, off of any organ that it's on. Um, we do think that endo is not as common on the upper um, organs, but I, I personally believe that that's not true. I just believe that they're not looking there um, because I know so many people that have had endo on other organs, like their diaphragm, their lungs, um, anywhere. It can, it's been found on every single organ. I just don't think that doctors are looking on every single organ. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm excited to get that final diagnosis for sure. That's awesome. I hope you get the diagnosis soon. Um, for me, basically, it was like, I did not suspect endometriosis until I was 23. I had no clue what it was. I went through nursing school, um, one of the best programs in the nation, and I still didn't know what endometriosis was. And I was doing a lot of like self-diagnosing because I was in nursing school and learning so much that I'd be like, oh, I have symptoms of that. Like, oh, I have symptoms of that. And a lot of it was like digestive issues. And then I would have a lot of hormonal sweating and facial flushing. So I've, I saw like a ton of specialists, like gastro, dermatology, urology. And um, most of them told me it was in my head and that I needed to see a psychiatrist. Um, so that was really like, I didn't know what to do at that point because then I was like, nobody's believing me. Um, and then I just stopped seeing doctors and I went through school, passed my boards and lost a ton of weight, was hospitalized for losing weight and they still didn't know what was wrong with me. And then um, I finally saw, was seeing new gynecologists and like the third gynecologist I saw was like, it sounds like you have all these three things. Um, so I had a pelvic MRI and the pelvic MRI actually showed um, two spots of possible endo or adenomyosis. They weren't sure which ones, but so it was kind of like a confirmation that, yeah, you need surgery um, to remove it. So that's how I found out that I had it. And then I did my research and I saw, um, I saw Dr. Sedgkin in New York city. So he was all right. He did my first and second surgery. Okay. Um, well, we kind of went over that things. So um, what treatments have you tried? What worked for you and what didn't work for you? Uh, I can tell you right now for my body, I, this, it doesn't, not everyone, um, but birth control made everything worse for me. I mean, my pain worse, made my periods more heavy, more painful, more frequent, which nobody wants in general. And with all this, you definitely don't want. Um, what worked the most for me, for my endometriosis, definitely excision surgery by an expert. Um, and at least in America, there aren't that many of them. Um, I'm not a big fan of Nancy's Nook, but she does have a good list of surgeons on Facebook. Um, that's where I found my first surgeon, um, Dr. Pasek in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and he was fantastic, but, uh, that's what worked for my endo and for my adeno, my hysterectomy. Yeah, I've been pain-free since, um, knock on wood, but, uh, that's what's worked the most is surgery. And unfortunately, sometimes that's like pretty much our only option. Yeah. You know, P Picos, I'm still trying to figure out my first medicine did not work well for me. Um, so I'm getting, working on my, working on getting my second one. So. I don't really have an answer for that one. Um, yeah, so for me, I honestly have tried every single medication in the book um, besides Lupron because I absolutely refuse to go on Lupron. Um, but I did try Oralissa, which is a very similar 
um, medication. Um, from my research, again, I'm not a medical professional, but I wish that I would have became a doctor just because endometriosis is so interesting. Um, I, it's like my hobby. I studied it inside and out uh, in my spare time, which is kind of uh, embarrassing. <laughs> um, but I, I have found with that that a lot of times there's no um, relief with if you've tried birth control and it doesn't work um, and you might have tried a step up on hormonal therapy, a lot of the next steps won't work for you either. Um, some people do have relief with birth control and that's great. Um, I unfortunately, again, was not one of those people and I followed the doctor's uh, suggestions by trying the next thing, trying the next thing. So I tried like Bizan, I tried Micronor, I tried uh, Oralissa, uh, all sorts of different birth controls, Depo-Provera, um, IUDs, different IUDs. Um, nothing has helped with the pain. Some of them have made it worse. Some of them have made my symptoms worse. I'm very similar to, um, to you, is it Kayla? Kayla, right? I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm very similar with you that another one of my major symptoms is nausea. So um, unfortunately with Oralissa, that was one that really, really made that worse. Um, so for me, what helps is I heat, like I, I'm, I'm managing at home until I have surgery. So heat is something that works better than anything I have tried. Um, as soon as the heat comes off, the pain's back usually. Um, Unfortunately, I try not to take medications too often, but when I'm in a state of needing to go to the emergency room, I do have um, Percocet on hand so that I can take that if I need to, which is obviously a very strong um, painkiller and I would rather not have to take it, um, but I do have that and it does help. Uh, it again, doesn't take the pain completely away, uh, which is just mind blowing to me that something so strong uh, only just minimizes the pain enough that you can get out of bed to go to the washroom, maybe get a cup of coffee or a cup of water. Um, but that's what it is. And um, besides that diet, uh, changing a little bit of my trigger foods, I know which ones trigger me, I know certain exercises trigger my pain. Um, stress is a huge, huge one. So I did do um, cognitive behavioral therapy with a chronic pain uh, psychologist, which really helped me um, be able to control my stress, uh, which then helped with my pain. Uh, so just kind of doing that physiotherapy as well, um, huge one for me, um, because a lot of my pain would go down into my hips and up my back. Um, and it down my legs even. And so being able to release those muscles so that those muscles also didn't tense at the same time as my flares really helps. So those are things that a lot of people are told to do while they're waiting for surgery or even after surgery to just like make sure that the pain either doesn't come back or is managed from all uh, perspectives. And it's helped me. I agree. Physiotherapy is like super important. And I actually have a friend who's had three endosurgeries and nobody has recommended physiotherapy to her. And I'm like, I started physiotherapy right away. Um, it's painful at times. Sometimes you're in more pain after, but like, it's going to help you feel better in the end. Um, and they don't just do internal work. Like I have a lot of chest pain and upper right bust, like um, upper right body side pain. And so like my PT works on like my full body, not just my pelvis. So physiotherapy is really great for helping pain. Um, I tried a bunch of birth controls from the age of 15 to 23 and none of them really worked. Um, I would skip my period so like that would help because I would skip like the exacerbation but I still had pain and I still had other symptoms and um, pretty much all birth controls make me suicidal so that started to become an issue um, and I had to stop taking them I tried like the marine IUD that never settled in my uterus it caused like pain the whole time um, I tried progestin only pills. I tried bio, bio identical pills, basically nothing really worked for me. Um, so the only thing that really helped was surgery and, 
Um, my most recent surgery, I think, is what's helped the most. Uh, one of my biggest symptoms for the last year would be I fall asleep on the toilet because I have to pee, but like it takes so long for my muscles to relax and like go that I would fall asleep on the toilet like and for long times. Um, so that hasn't happened since surgery. So like things like that, I'm like, woo, <laughs> win. Um, and other than that, heat he's huge for me. Um, I've actually been on narcotic medication for the last three years. Um, what else? Muscle relaxers. And right now I'm on Orlissa. Um, I was always against Orlissa, never wanted to try it, but I became desperate for help. Um, so I gave it a shot and it hasn't really caused me that many side effects and it stops my period. So it does stop the adenomyosis exacerbation, but I still have like uterine pain, like sometimes. Um, so I only have one more month on that. And after that, I have no clue what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> Basically just preventing the inevitable hysterectomy. me. Um, so yeah, that, those are things that have helped. Oh, and diet eating like gluten-free, dairy-free, try to eat anti-inflammatory, that helps. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is newly diagnosed or suspect diagnosed of these conditions? And quick reminder, we should wrap up within like the next five minutes or so. I would say don't stop fighting for yourself. I mean, as you heard from both of ours, all of our stories, it took years for us to get where we're at. Um, it took me, I started at 15, I'm almost 28, you know, and I'm finally feeling okay. But I mean, who knows how long that's going to last. I hope it lasts a while. Just don't give up. Keep fighting. Doctors will dismiss you. It happens. Um, and it sucks, but you got to find a new doctor, find a new path. And also don't be afraid to take it sounds funny coming out of my mouth, but don't be afraid to take breaks in your health and trying to fight for your health. Um, they both mentioned the physiotherapy. I've never tried it. Um, I was supposed to try it after my hysterectomy, but I needed a, I needed a break from trying to take care of myself. That sounds so bad, but <laughs> I'm taking my care of myself, but I just, you know, it can be really triggering and really you can get PTSD from it, um, which I had Yep. diagnosed um from my all of this and some other things that went on in my life so that you know don't give up and it's okay to take a break if you need a break I'll just quickly add on to that because I do want to get to the last question <laughs> um but I yeah I'd add to that um I think that it's just really important to understand that um, doctors are humans too. Um, they're only going to be as good as the education that they're given and the research that they've looked into. Um, unfortunately, what they're told in medical school a lot of the time isn't accurate information, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, or it's a 20 minute lecture on endometriosis, book closed, <laughs> that, if that. Um, so that's really unfortunate. Um, so what I would tell people is ensure that you even if it's a doctor, even if it's a specialist, a gynecologist, doesn't matter, really look for those excision specialists, making sure that that's who you're going to. And we're not talking just for surgery. We're talking for your treatment plan. Um, they might not even suggest surgery uh, for certain people. So I just really think that those people are the ones that you should be going to um, and ensuring that, again, like Laura said, you just keep fighting for yourself. If you need to take a break, uh, that's fine. Um, it's an exhausting disease to start with, uh, especially having to be your own advocate. So um, yeah, just keep pushing at your own pace, I guess. Um, to add on to all that, because totally agree, um, Google is not always right. So you can't always trust Google, just so you know. Um, you can't always trust every doctor and do a ton of research. So if you think you have are suffering from endometriosis, do as much research as you can. Educate yourself. Um, find articles that are reviewed by 
doctors that you know are well known, like excision specialists, um, and also excis excision specialist websites. A lot of them do have information that is correct. Um, and also follow Instagram accounts and Facebook groups. I found that really helpful in the beginning of my journey just to feel less isolated. Definitely, okay. And real quick, give one thing, um, advice that you want someone who has endometriosis, what you want doctors to know about endometriosis and what you want the public to know about endometriosis. I mean, I mainly have one for the doctors. Um, I think that, it, listen, <laughs> it, it's hard to hear everyone's like problems all day long. It gets exhausting, but you have to take the time to actually listen to what we're saying because um, it's very annoying to be dismissed when you're asking for help. Definitely. Yeah, I would say if you are a doctor wanting to go into this uh, specialty, um, specialize in it, um, making sure that you are, you know, going under some of them. There's amazing doctors. I'm, I'm from Canada personally. We don't have a lot up here, um, but there's some amazing doctors in the States and just making sure that maybe you get into one of their uh, programs to learn from them. Um, not trusting everything you learn, I think, in uh, university and medical school, because as I know from Canadian perspective, again, uh, we've had a little bit of um, sight into what they're learning on endometriosis, and some of it's not accurate. And again, like I said, it's sometimes a 20 minute lecture. Um, public, uh, just know that it's not a painful, just a painful period. It's a whole body disease. Um, it affects every aspect of our lives. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Um, and then someone who has suspected endo, um, same thing as what we were saying before, just make sure you're educated. Um, educate yourself because then you know what to look for with your specialist, um, what kind of care is appropriate, and you won't take no for an answer, um, which is really easy to do when you're being told by specialists or people that you think that you can trust. Definitely. Um, to add on, definitely educate yourself and never stop advocating for yourself because I can't even count the amount of doctors that I saw before endometriosis was brought up to me. So don't stop, like just keep going. Yeah. You know your body best and you know what feels right to you and what feels wrong. So don't stop. Keep going till you find an answer. Um, for the public, I would also say um, this is a whole body disease. It's not just a bad period. It can grow from your rectum to your nose. So just take that into consideration. And for doctors, I would really just want them to understand how truly painful these diseases are. Because sometimes I don't think that they understand just how much pain we suffer every single day. So. Well, thank you three very much for coming and we will do questions um, that our audience has after we talk to the doctor. Thank you so much for joining us, all of you, and for um, Dr. Mawad. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, we are very thankful for you to um, give some of your time to us and uh, share your expertise. Um, Dr. Mawad's a clinical associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and he's the founder of CEAPS, which is the Center for Endometriosis and Advanced Pelvic Surgery. He's an, obviously an MD and, uh, and a board certified gyne gynecological surgeon. So thank you so much, Dr. Mawad. So, you know, I just want to apologize on behalf of the medical community because they failed a lot of patients through the system. And then uh, I, I think it, it's a new era. Uh, uh, all of that is due to a lot of the advocacy groups and a lot of patients that want to raise their voices and talk about their disease. Because unfortunately, the way the medical system is designed failed a lot of patients. And I'm going to apologize on behalf of the whole medical community uh, because of that. Uh, I think 
we know the amount of stress that is uh, inflicted on the patient. We know a lot about the mental health that has been inflicted through that chronic pain on patients. And then we are here to raise the voice and then hand in hand with you guys, try to raise awareness and education, not only for patients, but for medical providers. Because this is very sad. And I hear those stories every single day in my clinic that patients are suffering and nobody is listening to them. They've been gaslighted. They've been tormented by medical professional. Uh, and then this is the time where we need to empower our patients and educate them to come and then choose and advocate for the best care they can deserve and they should deserve all the time. So thank you for having me. It's an honor and privilege to talk to you. And I can tell you on my behalf, I, I always cater to the scientific community. I always raise my voice to the scientific community. But I, and I realized lately in the past two years, we're not doing a direct consumer, if we're gonna put it in business term, direct consumer marketing talk to patients, listen to them, listen to their uh, needs, listen to their problems. We always like think if we publish more and if we talk more about the stuff, that means everybody's gonna know about it. But unfortunately, this is not the case. So I'm so privileged to be able to talk directly to patients and to advocacy groups. And then this is, makes me really overwhelmed. Thank you so much. That means a lot. And we really do appreciate your time and you volunteering it to us. So um, to start off with some questions, um, what kinds of treatments do you do for people with endometriosis? For me, it's uh, we have to stratify the problem in a sense. People with endometriosis is a, is a huge portion of the uh, fraction of the community and then the, the, the the patients, it's 10% of patients. So the treatment is, is not directed on a single encounter of care. It's not like, oh, I'm a surgeon, I'm very good at what I do, I do surgery and then you should be healed. And if you don't heal from my surgery, that means like you have uh, other problems. So the, the, the most important thing is to offer a comprehensive uh, care for, for patients with endometriosis because that disease is not only a physical disease, it's a mental, mental disease. It impacts a lot of, on your mental health. And then sometimes it's a disease that surgically it can improve, but also we need the ancillary people around the surgery. So it's not me, the hero, it's a teamwork. It's not a single person work. So surgery is one portion of the treatment, but the whole portion is a comprehensive approach. We need cognitive health therapists. We need pain doctors. We need multidisciplinary approach to endometriosis. So for me, the core of the treatment starts with a complete excision of the disease, complete excision of endometriosis, but this is only one portion of the treatment. We need to gather as multidisciplinary professionals together to offer the patient a comprehensive care of what they have and what they need to do. So uh, uh, cognitive therapists, pain doctors, pelvic floor physical therapists, uh, uh, mental health uh, uh, providers, all, them, all of them come together to provide the patient a, a teamwork to provide them the best care to improve their quality of life. This is not a terminal cancer that we're talking about. This is not like a, an illness that, you know, that can be cured. This is a chronic pelvic disease, the chronic disease that needs the, the constant or continuous care that starts with the surgery and continues with other, uh, uh, you know, disciplines. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, how do uh, treatments differ between uh, patients with endometriosis and adenomyosis? You know, adenomyosis, unfortunately, does not have the same attention as endometriosis. So adenomyosis is, uh, is a different disease. 
maybe it's a continuum of the same disease. Maybe it's a completely different disease because we see patients with adenomyosis, they do not have endometriosis. And in 50% of the patient with adenomyosis, they have associated endometriosis. So the science does not enable us to differentiate between those two, but there is a little nuances between those two things. Now, patients you know, desiring future fertility, the collaboration needs to be done with the fertility specialist because the preparation for adenomyosis patient to fertility is very different from patients to without adenomyosis. And, and, and I want to bring in from my surgical perspective, my surgical expertise, that adenomyosis does not need to be surgically a definitive treatment where we remove the uterus. There are a lot of options that are surgical possible for patients with adenomyosis. But these are clear indications for the patients who desires future fertility or for the patients who wants to preserve their uterus. They need to be a very good informed uh, um, you know, consent between the patient and the provider about the risk of different kinds of surgeries for adenomyosis, whether uterine sparing or definitive surgery for patients with adenomyosis in conjunction with the collaboration with their provider, because we can remove even diffuse adenomyosis surgically, and we've published about that. But this is a very specific indication. This has very specific surgical indication for these patients, because the most important thing that we don't understand right now is the contribution of symptoms from adenomyosis versus endometriosis. And then there need to be stratification because we don't want to sell hope to patients. We want to sell them the reality based on evidence-based. If they want to get pregnant, this is a complete different approach if they don't want to get pregnant. It's the easiest thing is to remove organs. I'm a surgeon and I know how easy it things. Sometimes it's easier for me if I want to go to a party to do just different things than if the patient wants, but this is not about me. This is about the patient, about the patient, what they need, what they envision, what are their goals. And my job is to assist those patients to reaching their goals. It's not what's convenient for me. Oh, let me remove your uterus and I will cure your adenomyosis. That's true, but this is not about me. It's about the patient. So I think patients have a lot of options with adenomyosis, even if, their provider think that they have limited options by removing their uterus, but I think collaborating with their fertility in, in the way they're prepping and they're optimizing them for fertility through different cycles than whatever they do for regular patients is very key and very important. And reaching and accessing the right partner uh, surgeon for the patient's goals is the most important thing. Reaching an expert, even though like you need to travel, even though you need to do things out of your comfort zone, but it's very important for you to empower you to get the options that you want and to empower you to get the information that you need to make the decision that suits you most definitely. When we talk about endometriosis or adenomyosis, I see a lot of patients feel disabled because they are showered with decision-making based on their provider skills and convenience. And this is not the reality. The science empowers you to do things based on your needs and your goals, irrelevant of the convenience of your surgeons. So it's, it's very important to encourage patients to get second, third, fourth, fifth opinion to get whatever the goal they want to achieve. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, what do you recommend for patients who are diagnosed with endometriosis and adenomyosis? What should they do and not do in regards to their care and their care team? So I tell my patients all the time, if they don't want to, if they hate me, they don't want to see me ever again. And they hate the, my, the encounter with me, whenever they run away, they have to have two things in mind. First, they should not cave for an open surgery or a laparotomy or a traditional big cut, they should seek minimally invasive surgery. The other thing is they should understand all the options 
And then this is the problem now we have currently with the social media and globalization of care, where everybody claims they are expert in whatever they do. And everybody praise their expertise because they, they, they talk to the patient about their bag or their shoes or blah, blah, blah. That means they're the super nice doctor. So what they need to do, and they need to understand, they need to be bold to ask their doctors, how many of those cases have you done? What is your experience? Don't tell me, don't recite me the literature where it does not apply to me. Don't tell me like, oh, the recurrence rate is 70%. Tell me in your practice, what is your recurrence rate? They should demand for the doctor, how many cases have you done? How many of those have you addressed? What is your experience with deeply infiltrative endometriosis or with adenomyosis? Rather than tell me, look, oh, I read an article where the adenomyosis patient, 30% of the, that does not apply to me. I'm here with you. I'm in your hands. In your hands, what is your experience? So this is very important. If you, see, if you bring to your doctor an in, in MRI and they look at the report run away because we're not, treating a radiologic report we're treating a patient a whole human body so if you don't take the time to read the images or you get yourself trained to read the images like i tell my patients run away if you don't take the time to answer all my questions and all my concerns and dissipate my anxiety run away if you don't you cannot take care of me when I'm before surgery. How are you going to troubleshoot my complications after surgery? How are you going to understand what I'm feeling if I cannot have access to you? If every time I call your office, I'm going to be put on hold for two hours and I get an appointment in four weeks, how am I going to do surgery with you? How am I going to let you operate on my body? The most sacred thing that I have, you're going to take it for granted and then tell me at the end of the day, like, hey, listen, uh, we've done what we can do. No. So these are the important stuff to look for a surgeon. It's not because they have glamorous reviews on the internet or because your friend told you he's the best amazing surgeon, whatever, or she's the best amazing surgeon, whatever applies for you, for your friend does not apply particularly to you. So doctors should individualize the treatment for their patients, should take care, like you have one fingerprints that nobody else in the 6 billion population have. And when you have endometriosis, you have your own prints in surgery and that should be respected and individualized for you rather than generalized for the rest of the population. That's the most important thing I tell my patient to do. Yes, definitely. Um, what would you want the general population to know about these um, conditions, whether it be endometriosis, adenomyosis, any gynecological conditions? I'm gonna cite in today like a patient that I saw that I, I talked to the patient and she expressed like, a lot of the symptoms that will fit in. And then I talked to her husband, which is a doctor, shocking. And then he said like, she never had pain. So for me, the most important thing is validating the symptoms for patients, validating their experience. I can never be in their shoes because probably I'll be, you know, in a, in, in a mental institution suffering from severe depression and torture and the, uh, the gaslighting is on those patients maximizes and amplifies their mental health symptoms. So for me, the most important thing is you have to listen, listen, listen. It's not about you. It's not proving your, about proving your skills. It's about listening to your patients and their needs. It's, it's enough labeling those patients crazy because you don't understand, you cannot diagnose, and you don't have the skills to take care of them. Have the ethical obligation to refer those patients to people who knows how, who know how to take care of those uh, patients. So for me, it's the general population needs to know that this is not a painful period. This is not like, oh, everybody have cramp in their period, no. It's about listening to them and validating their symptoms based on what they feel and trying to address those and support them and encourage them to seek and advocate for themselves and empower them with the right education. That's what I tell 
other the other po- people in the population to understand that if it does not happen with you, that does not mean it doesn't exist. I've got sisters laughing at their sisters for having endometriosis because they've never experienced anything like this. Are you crazy? Like I, I don't have pain in my period. And this is not right. And patients needs to know this is not the norm. To be suffering, to be tormented, to be feeling that low, to be depressed because of their period, to compromise their quality of life. And, and this is enough that what, all what we're doing here, we're pushing patients to advocate for themselves, to raise their voice. It, I, I'll tell you another funny story. Like, you know, in, in, in this era, I'm an OBGYN, I'm a GYN surgeon, but I trained in OBGYN. I can tell you, I have a few referral from OBGYN because the problem is everybody thinks they're doing the greatest job. And then today, literally, I've got an OBGYN call me. I said like, what did you do to my patient? I've done four surgeries on her. And then she kept, I thought she's crazy. And you've done one surgery on her and she recovered and she's calling me to thank me that she, I referred you to her. And I said, like, I've done what is appropriate to do on that patient, a full excision surgery. And she said to me, like, oh, my God, I cannot believe, like, I've done four surgeries on her. And then she never said, like, she said to her, like, I've been 25 years in pain. This is the first time I feel I have no pain. So we have to acknowledge our skills and we have to have the ethical obligation to refer these patients to a person who understand better the disease, who spend more time taking care of the disease. And that's the most important thing. And then for those patients, if you do surgery that was promised that this is gonna relieve your pain and you don't have a relief of your pain, go seek another expert, go seek another opinion because you deserve better than this. Yeah, definitely. Um, How would that differ from what you would want other doctors and physicians to know about endometriosis and adenomyosis? It sounds like just listen to your patients is a very big thing. Um, would you recommend they do anything else? Well, this is the story of my life. Like I, I'm always feeling like I probably will get deported one day from the US because I get angry at a lot of other physicians from dismissing their patients. But uh, now I'm an American citizen, so I'm not worried about that. I can speak loudly and I can tell you uh, the truth about things. You know, when we look at patient as this is a business encounter, I'm going to make money off the surgery. This is when you start failing yourself, failing your patient, failing your Hippocratic uh, oath, being the best care. Uh, For me, the most overriding principle of physicians is do not harm. And whenever the doctor realizes they're harming their patient, whether through their mental harming, psychological harming, gaslighting them, or whether through physical harming, providing them a suboptimal surgery, then we're gonna change the whole community to take better care of patients. The hardest thing for a doctor is to refer a patient because they feel like they're inferior, they cannot care. But how can you be a super athlete with the 100 meter, 200 meter, 400 meter, uh, uh, one kilometer, and then uh, you know 10,000 meters and a marathon? There's no athlete that won gold medal in all those, these kind of, you know, modalities. You have to focus on what you do best and provide the best care of your patient. It's okay if you cannot know. It's okay if you don't know. It's okay if it's not your area of, of, of expertise. And it's so okay whenever the patient, you refer the patient for them to get the best care. Patient will thank you forever. So it's not about us. Patient asked me about a birth control pill. I tell her like the last time I prescribed a birth control pill, it's 10 years ago. Let me refer you to a friend of mine that knows more better and they can spend more time with you about their birth control pill. I don't feel ashamed about that. But doctors should start not feeling ashamed about like if they refer a patient that is beyond their skills of surgical care rather than checking the box putting the CPT codes and making the money off that patients. This is not sustainable. Most definitely. 
thank you <laughs> for being the way you are. I wish um, positions like you were not so rare as they seem. Um, do you have any final thoughts for us on what you would want um, patients to know or um, people who are trying to seek help but aren't really getting anything? Well, I, I can tell you guys, you are the staple of the community. You're doing an amazing job in empowering patients to, to advocate better for themselves. I cannot thank you enough because without you, that whole movement will not exist. And then every bits and pieces, and then we talk probably uh, over Instagram, and then I want to move you know, mountains to be able to have that platform to tell you that, we, first of all, I apologize on behalf of the medical community, even though it's not my fault, but I have the guts to apologize on behalf of all of them. And then the other things is what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a bigger movement that will impact the quality of life of a lot of patients in the sense that the superpower for patients is the knowledge and the superpower of knowledge is the better value of care, better quality of care. And this is all what you're doing. And I'm so privileged to be so privileged to be able to spend the time with you and to use that platform to be able to communicate with you and to know from a different perspective the patient's needs and the 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 value of the things that we do. So thank you so much. And then I really applaud your work and your hard efforts. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Um, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Milan? Yeah, you, other Gabby, other like doctor is not going to change anything in my life. So, uh, and my last name is so confusing. So you can call me Gabby and then uh, that would help a lot of people to be easily access, uh, feel easily accessible to me. I have one question. Um, you mentioned that you have a lot of different modalities for treating adenomyosis before hysterectomy. Could you name some of them? Because I'm at the point where my endometriosis has been pretty much taken care of um, and I'm dealing with a lot of uterine pain and we don't really know what to do next. So adenomyosis is two types, either focal adenomyosis, which presents as like fibroids or diffuse adenomyosis, which is a thickening of the wall of the anterior. I, have, I yes. have both. Yes. So for focal adenomyosis, this is super easy. We can take out the focal adenomyosis and take care of that. The diffuse adenomyosis, it will become a little bit of more technically challenging because when we do want to remove diffuse adenomyosis, we're going to shave the uterus wall anteriorly and posteriorly, and we're going to reconstruct the uterus. So that is something that we offer for patients who are really on the verge of trying to get fertility treatment or trying to carry a kid because adenomyosis by its nature is diffuse and it continues to progress with time. So if I do your surgery for diffuse adenomyosis and you decided to get pregnant in seven years, probably the, the chances that you're going to recur adenomyosis is really high. So, but these are the stuff, taking out the adenomyosis, reconstructing the uterus, that carries a lot of risk during the pregnancy and that, carry, that push you to do a C-section in your, uh, for your delivery. And at the same time, that puts you at high risk for uterine rupture. But, you know, again, with the right informed consent for the patients, with the right education for the patient, patients are willing to pick what's best for them, take the best risk for themselves, uh, depending on what they're trying to achieve. Now, the treatment for pain with adenomyosis becomes really critical because if you have a complete excision of endometriosis and you have a preserved adenomyosis, most likely your pain is not related only to the uterus, but also to the pelvic nerves that feeds the uterus. So surgery for that, it's hit or miss. So again, individualizing the treatment, looking at the picture, looking at the MRI, talking to the patients, laying their conditions out loud and laying as a smorgasbord all their options for them. Patients know how to choose what's best 
for themselves and then taking the risk that they see fit for their condition is the best option. But there are options of uterine sparing, uh, uh, uterine sparing stuff for uh, uh, surgical uterine sparing for adenomyosis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Any other questions? I hope you understand my uh, foreign accent, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Any other <laughs> questions for Gabby or any other one of our speakers? Anything at all? <laughs> Have we covered everything today? Oh my God, I cannot believe either people understood my language or people did not understand anything that I feel like <laughs> any questions. <laughs> well, it's great. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for your time and your expertise in these areas. Um, and thank you so much for everyone for coming out and listening to this presentation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye.